The Lord be with you. And A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. A Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now there was a sinful woman in the city who learned that he was at the table in the house of the Pharisee. Bringing an alabaster flask of ointment, she stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with ointment. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus said to him in reply, Simon, I have something to say to you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people were in debt to a certain creditor. One owed 500 days wages, the other owed 50. Since they were unable to repay the debt, he forgave it for both. Which of them will love him more? Simon said in reply, The one, I suppose, whose larger debt was forgiven. He said to him, You have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet, but she has bathed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she has not ceased kissing my feet since the time I entered. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. So I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, because she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. He said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The others at the table said to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Afterwards, he journeyed from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Accompanying him were the twelve, and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Jonah, the wife of Herod Stewards Tuza, Susanna, and many others who provided them out of their resource. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Father's Day weekend. <laughs> that, happy Father's Day weekend. Oh, the whole weekend now? Yeah. I suppose Happy Father's Day week. Yeah. You know, might as well take whatever we can get. It's like birthdays around here. They go on forever. I'm sorry George Clasby can't be here, but you know he fell and he broke his shoulder. And, uh, you know, so he's going for all kinds of, of third, fourth, fifth opinions because... Uh, they, they, they don't want to disrupt other parts of his health by giving him, um, you know, anesthesia and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we remember him especially today. Um, today uh, we, we gather together, and I think we've been very well conditioned, as I said before, by some very crystal clear, um, let's say, principles. And I think principles that are, you know, crystal clear are really very handy for us as humans because I don't know if uh, when we're trying to put order into our lives, whether it be in our own lives or our family's lives, those over whom we have some sort of, um, of authority or responsibility, uh, we want to kind of avoid the gray areas. So making it black and white is not very, very easy. Okay? So one of those areas is right 
and wrong. And uh, they have a, a real name for that these days called dualism. It's just something's either right or something's either wrong. And in all cases, the wrong is absolutely to be avoided, and in all cases, the right is to be done. It's not a bad principle. But I think sometimes that the life we live, you know, it kind of shows us that this is the impossible task. And being the impossible task, I think a lot of people are discouraged. It might be one of the reasons why the seats are kind of empty today. I mean, you know, okay, already, you know, we've done our best, and when we come to hear the gospel, maybe we're constantly reminded of the fact that, you know, no matter how hard we try, we never quite make the mark. So I'm going to make an analogy here. So put that on, on hold, and uh, I'm going to tell you something about uh, the Bream group that I have and the whole uh, process of helping people walk through their grief, okay? Um, early on, one of the first persons, and, and really to her credit, to study the process of grief was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She began by talking about what a person goes through when they get the bad news that they have a terminal disease. So basically, at first, it's all about, I'm going to die, and what stages do I go through? Later on, though, she was able to extend this and say how it applies not only to the person who's dying, but to the people who are left behind. And it can be applied to all sorts of loss, from loss of a person's life all the way to loss of a job, loss of career, loss of, uh, of any number of things that we go through in life. So in any case, this is a pretty crystal clear, linear expression of what happens. Do you remember this? First of all, there's denial. Okay, I feel fine. Denial is kind of what people go through when somebody dies and they are expecting them to come through the door in the next minute. It really couldn't happen. Finally then, anger. It's not fair. Why me? How could this be? Then there's bargaining. And the person goes through, I'll do anything for a few more years. I'll give my life savings, I'll turn, stand on my head, I'll, I'll go to Africa and feed, feed the poor, I'll, I'll do all sorts of things if I can just reverse this situation. Finally, depression. And I very carefully use the word depression because we're trained never to say uh, the patient was depressed. You know? That's a diagnosis. But anyway, this is, I'm so sad, I'm so sad. You know, why bother with anything? It's kind of, I'll stay in bed and cover my head with a... Uh, with, uh, with uh, covers and that's it. And finally, acceptance. It's going to be okay. Now while Elizabeth Kubler-Ross really mentioned that it doesn't always go clearly in that order, those are generally the stages that people go through when they have had the bad news that they're going to pass away. But they also, um, they also, uh, it also applies to when they lose somebody they love. Now, right now, I'm not going to be able to find something. Now, this is all the different things we have. Anger, anniversary of death, a ball of emotions. Today, instead of this nice, clear list, in the, in the realm of bereavement, they say, what you go through is this. On this ball of emotions, they're all twisted together, almost like fat yarn. And here is abandonment, vindictiveness, sadness, anxiety, rage, anguish, disappointment, yearning, loneliness, betrayal, helplessness, distrust, rejection, bitterness, rage, denial. And I don't even know if they know what the final stage is where you end up resolving grief. <clears throat> my theory is that you never resolve grief. The other day I was uh, in my uh, neighborhood and the bells tolled in the church where I went to uh, said my first mass and went to grammar school in that parish and those bells had not tolled a whole time that I had been in that church as uh, an aware uh, individual but when I was an infant we lived across the street from that church and they used to you know ring the Angelus so I saw, oh my gosh, they're ringing the Angelus. This was like uh, recently. I'm going, my gosh, they, they fixed the bells. I got to call mom. Uh, yeah. 
Oh, is that weird? She's been dead since 1992? I, I have to call mom. Then I thought about my aunt. Oh, And I went down the list, almost in order of death, and realized all those people were gone. And you know what? I felt like weeping. So that to me proves that the sadness never goes away. But the bitterness of sadness, I believe, is basically... It's, um, it's, not, it's not recovering from something, it's managing pain. So that one day, the bitter anguish becomes bittersweet. And you can smile even as you feel sadness. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but what they're saying is it isn't all that clear cut what people go through. And the end stage is different for everybody. Since this is what people go through, there's one in there that says guilt. I've had people say, I'm not a bit guilty. I know I did everything I possibly could. Where other people say, if only I had, if only I had, if only I had. So you can see the nice, clear list of Kuma Ross. And it's not to say anything bad about her. She started this, this uh, very thoughtful look at what it is to uh, look towards your own demise or to experience grief. We now know that it's a whole lot more. People who believe that completely were thinking they were going crazy. Well, I'm not going through that. I'm also going through this. I'm also going through that. So people continue to study and say, it's not just clear. It's not just linear. It's a mixture. In today's uh, first reading, we heard about, you know, King David. King David <laughs> is undisputably called what? The... <laughs> Don't everybody speak at once. The... <laughs> Hey, greatest king, the greatest king. See, she works with me, so she's <laughs> He's the greatest king of Israel, all right? But he's in trouble here. You know what he's in trouble over? Are you listening? Does everybody know that? Not everybody knows that story. You all know that story, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. He's out on the roof. He looks over and he sees this woman bathing. Huh? <laughs> right? So he's the king. He used his power poorly. He said, bring that woman to me. And they... Uh, they did the bad thing, but the evil thing. So they did the bad thing, and then, so anyway, uh, afterwards, she was pregnant. Now, uh, you know, there was, uh, there's no DNA testing, there's no anything like that. He was going to be guilty, for sure. So he brings Uriah, the, the husband, in to, uh, you know, sleep with her, and there would be confused as to who the father was. But guess what happened? Uriah, I'm not going to have the pleasures of my wife's bed when my friends are out there on the front lines <laughs> losing their lives, and he slept in the portico, and he wouldn't go in. Now, David's getting really panicked, right? The greatest king of Israel. So what does he do? He sends him back, and he sends a message, and put him on the front line, so he will be killed. And he was killed. Now, that, can we still call him the greatest king of Israel? I mean, if we're doing the black and white thing, he's gone now. Especially, you know, if he... If he does something in these days, oh, you do that, you're, you're out of the picture. You're not included. Mm -hmm. He prayed. He repented. She had the baby. The baby died. And that, was the, that was, in a sense, the consequences for him. But guess who the next baby was? Solomon. So, even in the history of our salvation, you see this mixture going on. You see this mixture going on. You see Jesus in the gospel. You know, the woman who, you know, that wasn't Mary Magdalene. You figured out it wasn't Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene gets a bad rap. She was not a prostitute. She had a few demons that he knocked out of her. But, you know, she was different than this woman who cried and wiped his feet and showed that because she had been forgiven much, she loved much. We're people who sit around here sometimes, and I'm not saying all of us are, who go into this guilty thing and we're not good enough and, and, it, and it causes us problems and our self-esteem goes down when we're not aware of the fact that in the history of salvation which by the way we are part of God sees this as something that's a mixture and out of this mixture comes good so I'm not telling you go home and have a field day <laughs> But I am saying, why do we get hung up on things as though there's this clear right and clear wrong? When 
even in the gospel, Jesus talks about the advantage of a person being forgiven much and then being able to do the one thing that is the essence of the Christian life, and that is love. Or that a person like David, who is famous in history, in all history, was somebody who fell so miserably, and it wasn't about adultery only, it was murder, and yet the Lord continued to use him. God wants to use you. He isn't putting it off. He isn't having you come here just so you can sit here and be kind of consoled by the message and that's it. Because this is a cons consoling message, you know, okay, maybe we're not so bad. But it's more than that. It shows that in every case, those people who are forgiven loved and continued to do the work of God and continue to stand forth as exemplars of what it was to belong to God, even though not perfect. So, if you're not perfect, that's okay. Fathers, <laughs> this is Father's Day. We need to honor those fathers who are living and pray for those fathers who have gone on before. And uh, we uh, sometimes as fathers can look back and see, how did I do? What did I say? What mistakes did I make? Go through all the balls of emotion in a sense of loss when we look at the lost opportunity to continue to parent a child. But I'm letting you know that uh, you're no match for God's will, and let's allow ourselves to be open to His will, and even to be open to the fact that we ain't as bad as we thought we were. Let's rise now and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is invisible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only